Kia ora koutou katoa, no mai haremaki te manatū haora, welcome back and uh, nice to see you again uh, for our update today on the outbreak and I've also got Dr Ian Town with me here today who's going to speak uh, specifically to long COVID and some of the research and service responses we've got in place here. Before I do, do start on our update, I just want to acknowledge today being 15th of March, three years since that uh, terrorist attack on the two Christchurch mosques that killed 51 
uh, New Zealanders and left many more with life-threatening injuries. So I want to acknowledge from here the incredible work that was done by our colleagues working in um, Canterbury DHB and the staff there, not just in the immediate aftermath, but also to follow up and continue to support and care for the victims and their whānau and their, their ongoing health and wellbeing needs. So today, our outbreak update, there are 21,616 new cases with 960 people in hospital around the country. Just 22 are in ICU or a high dependency ward and uh, further details and breakdown are provided in our one o'clock update. Uh, a little more detail of the hospitalisations in the northern region where we have very good automated data. There are 559 people and of those, 40%, which is 233, are aged 70 or older, over, and the average age is 58. So we have seen a shift towards older people being in hospital. And we know they're more likely to require longer care and so may have a longer length of stay in hospital. I'm also aware there's a lot of interest in how many of the people who are in hospital are there because of COVID or how, versus how many are there with COVID. The reason that someone is in hospital is not actually finalised until they are discharged through a very careful and internationally consistent coding process. However, we do know there will be three groups of people in hospital with COVID. First, those who are there uh, primarily because of COVID-related symptoms that need to be managed in hospital and can't be managed in the community or by individuals at home. The second group are people who have pre-existing conditions like diabetes or heart disease who get COVID and that may be exacerbating their underlying condition. So they are provisionally admitted for the treatment of that underlying condition rather than COVID per se, but it may well be the COVID infection is what has tipped them to requiring hospital level care. <clears throat> and third, there is a group of people who are admitted for other reasons, unrelated. For example, they've had an injury or they require maternity care they also happen to have COVID. Now, we have got some data from hospitalisations at Waikato Hospital between the 2nd and the 11th of March that gives an insight into how many are in each category. And I will walk through these, but we can provide them in writing afterwards too, if that helps. So during that period of around nine days, just 19% of people were admitted to be looked after in the respiratory service. So the main reason that they were in hospital was for treatment of COVID-related symptoms. There were a, th a further 36%, so just over a third, who were admitted for other medical care. For example, heart disease or, or kidney disease. Now some of those people, it may well be their underlying condition was exacerbated by becoming infected with COVID-19, but it was not the main reason for their admission. <clears throat> and there were 23% of people admitted at that time who were there on surgical wards, looked after by surgical teams. So they were definitely there for reasons other than COVID, and another 7% who were being looked after by the obstetrics and gynaecology service, and some of those that would have been for maternity care. The rest, the other 15%, were children admitted to the paediatric ward, and some of them again may have been with, and some may have been because of COVID. But overall, at least a third of people admitted during that time happened to have COVID, but were not in hospital because of COVID. And only about 20% were there primarily to have their COVID-related symptoms um, uh, treated. Now, this is one hospital at one point in time that it, it does provide some insights, and we will continue to have a look at this. And we, what we want to do is look prospectively at people who are admitted with COVID and try and create a, a picture, at least in one or two of our hospitals. I'd also like to share a few slides today, uh, just around the picture, two slides around the picture of the outbreak in Auckland, the Omicron outbreak. Uh, so far, Auckland, as we know, has had the majority of cases and hospitalisations. So tracking what is happening there is important, and it will also give us an indication of what might happen around the rest of the country. So first of all, we have a slide that shows for the northern regions for DHB, so that does include Northland. Uh, the number of cases, which is the blue line, compared with three transmission scenarios that were modelled by Tipu Naha Matatini before the outbreak. Uh, 
you will see here that the, the high scenario that was modelled peaks at around 11,000 cases in the northern region uh, during the second week of March. Incidentally, that's about 50 times the peak we saw during the Delta outbreak last year. As you can see, actually the case numbers got higher than that high transmission scenario that was modelled. There are a couple of reasons why that may be. One is that we introduced rapid antigen tests and we've had actually remarkable levels of reporting by people of their rapid antigen test results, both positive and negative. The other is, and I will come to this, it may well be a reflection of the fact that we've got quite a high proportion of our cases that are the BA2 subvariant of Omicron. I will come back to that. But what you can see is after that peak, quite clearly in Auckland, the number of cases is now on the way down. This second slide shows occupied hospital beds. Uh, we know that new, uh, sorry, it doesn't, it shows new hospital admissions for the northern region. They are following the pattern that was modelled with a higher peak than was initially modelled for that high scenario. While the number of new admissions each day seems to be on the way down, we are still seeing the number of total number of people in hospital in the northern region continuing to increase. For example, it was 655 today and only 628 yesterday. However, as the number of new admissions starts to track down, we will see the number of, total number of people in hospital in the northern region decline too. And importantly, the number of people in intensive care because of COVID-19 remains well within the modelled scenarios, very low rates. And finally, I spoke to this last Thursday, but I did want to provide this graph. It shows just how quickly during February the Omicron variant took over as the main variant uh, um, out or overshadowing Delta. And furthermore, uh, you can see that the BA2 variant now makes up between around 75 and 80 per cent of the cases that are having a PCR and then whole genome sequenced. Most of these will be people in hospital. For example, the latest report from the 10th of March, there were 47 hospitalised people who had their whole genome sequence done in, the, in that preceding few days. And of those, there were 25 with the Omicron BA2 variant and 22, sorry, BA1 and 22 with the BA2 variant. But we have seen that very interesting shift there. And so just reflecting on my earlier comment about why that peak might have gone higher in Auckland and may well elsewhere in the country, higher than the high transmission scenario, it could well be a, a reflection of the fact that we have got a predominance of the BO2 subvariant. And you will have seen around the world uh, the evidence emerging that this variant, this subvariant, and some people think it's actually a separate variant, I'll leave it to the scientists to debate that, but it's about 30% more transmissible even than the BA1 variant, the subvariant. Now, this may well help us act in our favour, in fact, if the majority of cases here through our outbreak are BA2, because what we are seeing in New South Wales and in the UK, and I've just read uh, a, a, an update from Scotland in particular, that it's got about 85% of their current cases are BA2 variant. You can see that even those jurisdictions that had an initial quite big Omicron outbreak are getting a second one that seems to be associated with the BA2 subvariant. There's a possibility we will miss that second big peak again that other countries are seeing. But in Scotland at the moment, they have the highest rate, uh, case rate that they have seen in nearly two years. And they've got about 1,800 people in hospital there at the moment compared with the 960 we've got. And of course, this is sort of their second wave of Omicron. Anyway, I thought that would be of interest to you. I will leave it up there. Uh, finally, just uh, some data that I think emphasise the importance of boosters, especially for Omicron. As epidemiologist and colleague Professor Rod Jackson pointed out yesterday, uh, the most important thing anyone can do is to make sure they are vexed to the max. So that means getting a booster if you are 18 or over. And we, uh, we are changing our language around this. Previously, we talked about fully vaccinated being two doses and a booster dose on top of that. Really, what we should be talking about is being up to date with vaccinations. And it's quite clear now for Omicron, being up to date means having three doses, period. So at the moment, we've got around 73% of people have been boosted, which is great. 
but it also means there are nearly 950,000 people who are eligible who haven't had a booster. Please do go and do that. It's incredibly important. We know that, e uh, that after two doses of the vaccine, effectiveness against getting Omicron and or being hospitalised with it does wane. I want to give uh, some figures from a, a report from the Northern Region from the 8th of March that showed just 16% of people admitted to hospital specifically for COVID in the preceding two weeks had had their booster more than two weeks before being admitted. So fully 84% of those people were not fully boosted. That's 84% of the people admitted for COVID. So even though only a small proportion of our population now has not had two vaccinations. It's really, really clear that a booster protects people from being hospitalised and we know it also protects people, helps protect people from dying from Omicron. And in that same period of time, in the two weeks prior to 8th of March in the Northern Region, just one person admitted to ICU had had their booster at least two weeks prior to admission. So. We now very clearly understand, or this emphasises what we knew. You need three doses of the vaccine to gain protection against Omicron. That third dose could be life-saving for you or a whānau member or a friend. So please, if you haven't already, go and get boosted today. I'd like to now hand over to Dr Town. Thank you, Ashley. Today I'd like to talk with you a little bit about long COVID, how you can get help, and how the New Zealand health sector is working together, both here in New Zealand and with our international counterparts, to develop guidelines for management. The good news, of course, is that most people who develop COVID recover completely. How there are, there are a number of folk that continue to develop symptoms or continue to experience symptoms which go on for a number of weeks and once it gets to about 12 weeks then this term long COVID starts to be used. Now there are a whole range of symptoms that uh, this sy syndrome can include including particularly low energy and fatigue, shortness of breath and cough which of course reflects the impact of COVID on the lungs themselves, headaches, low mood, and difficulty concentrating or cognitive impairment, often described as a brain fog or something akin to that. There may be ongoing chest pains and a race, racing pulse, joint pains and aches and pains and even weakness in the muscle may continue, muscles may continue, ongoing changes to the sense of taste or smell, and poor quality of sleep. And if you believe you may be suffering from any of these symptoms, the key thing to do is to have a chat to your doctor or healthcare professional. And we're also providing advice about long COVID, what, it may be, what you may be experiencing, and practical tips on how to recover safely on the Ministry's website. Now, there is a lot of research going on internationally about long COVID, and some of you may have seen a recent study which showed some impacts on the brain itself. Indeed, uh, an MRI study showed before and after COVID there may be some shrinkage of particular areas of the brain. This yielded some fascinating images, but probably raised as many questions as it did answers about what the cause of these changes may be. Is it something to do with the immune response or does the virus somehow directly affect the brain itself? The researchers were able to show that there were changes in the brain area that is responsible for the processing of smell. So that goes along with our knowledge of the impacts on taste and smell, and also in the area where the brain is involved with memory processing. So around the world, researchers are continuing to look at ways of understanding these lingering impacts, but also practical ways of treating this long-term syndrome, which is not dissimilar in some respects to what other we might otherwise call uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. As we get better advice from overseas peak bodies and from research we'll be doing here in New Zealand, we'll be able to provide more practical advice and a rehabilitation programme. Healthcare professionals are sharing their experience and we've been liaising with them through Martin Chadwick, our Chief Allied Health Officer, and we've agreed that he will chair an expert advisory group to provide guidance and support to healthcare pr practitioners here in New Zealand. One of the things we're interested in is, of course, our experience recently has been mainly with the Omicron variant, 
and whether or not this is more or less likely to cause long COVID is something of great interest to us. Now, in addition to this expert advisory group, the Ministry is also funding an important study called the Impacts of COVID-19 in Aotearoa Study, which is being undertaken by research colleagues based here in Wellington at the Victoria University of Wellington. This study aims to understand the experiences in Aotearoa New Zealand, who have, those who have had COVID-19, looking both at the short and the long-term impacts of contracting this illness on health, well-being, uh, and other factors. We'll be looking at the experience both within families, whānau, and Pacific families, as well as people with disabilities, to give us some broad information about people's experience over time. And we're certain that this research, when it's received by the expert advisory group, will be able to help us plan better for future management of those with this condition. Now, we've sent out about 8,000 invitations from the Ministry of Health by letter or text to people that have been diagnosed with COVID here in New Zealand. And we'd love people to take part in the study. So a very specific invitation is to call the 0800 number, 0800 800 581. That's 0800 800 581 to talk to the researchers about the possibility of participating. That would be incredibly helpful. We do know that in recovery from infections such as this, it's important to take it easy, to rest, and uh, undertake the advice that is provided to you by your health practitioner. Overseas, we're starting to learn about how common this is uh, in the post-COVID environment, and international statistics do provide some clues. Estimates from the United Kingdom show that about one in five people who tested positive for COVID-19 have continued to experience a range of some of the symptoms that I've mentioned for more than five weeks after their initial diagnosis. And about one in 10, that's 10% of people who'd experienced COVID, continued to have symptoms up to 12 weeks after their initial diagnosis. This is very similar to data that we've seen from the United States, from the National Institutes of Health, where they found that 10% of people continue to complain of some of these symptoms for up to three months after contracting COVID-19. And this can occur both in people that have had relatively mild COVID symptoms in the acute phase, as well as those that have had more severe symptoms and have been admitted to hospital. A study which followed up followed up 110 patients who'd been hospitalised in the United Kingdom, found that around three quarters of these continued to experience symptoms in the 12 weeks. And the most common symptoms that were experienced and reported in this sample was breathlessness and fatigue. So while for many people the Omicron variant illness that we're experiencing here in New Zealand at the moment may be relatively mild, some of these will have ongoing symptoms, some of these people. So our plan is to provide evidence-based guidelines for uh, our health practitioners, both in NGOs, primary care and secondary care, to help guide the recovery of patients with these ongoing problems. And it's very important, I think, and I know that the Director General has emphasised this previously in his remarks, that this is definitely not a disease to be taken trivially. Uh, just getting it for the sake of getting it may have long-term and short-term consequences. So that is not advised, and we're continuing to emphasise our public health measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Bloomfield. Good. Thanks, Ian. Uh, well, we're now open for questions, um, and I'm very happy for most of those to be directed to Dr. Town, but questions <laughs> for me. Thank Sorry, you. mine are for you. Um, mm. When it comes to case numbers in Wellington, mm. are we seeing them rising quicker here than in other regions at the moment? Uh, there's no doubt there's a, there's a pretty full-on outbreak here in Wellington. Uh, and uh, I think the rate of increase is similar to what we may have seen in Auckland, Waikato, Bay of Plenty and others beforehand. In fact, the DHB region with the highest case rate, per, per capita case rate at the moment, is Tairawhiti. Right, and when it comes to Wellington uh, potentially heading into a peak, do you think that's happening at the moment or on its way? Uh, it's, we, I think we're still on the way up here in the Wellington region, so that would include Capital and Coast and Hutt Valley District Health Boards. Uh, and it will be down to people and what they do in terms of staying home and uh, not spreading it to others and of course everybody using masks, physical distancing uh, and so on to actually 
ensure that we can turn that uh, that peak around as quickly as possible. And do you have concerns about how that uh, that increase of cases we're seeing is impacting on the DHBs here? Oh, I think the DHBs have got good plans in place. The hospitalisation numbers at the moment are well within what they had uh, anticipated and are uh, putting their plans into place. Of course, we are seeing here in uh, Wellington and around the country when uh, the DHBs have got quite high case numbers in hospital. They do need to scale back some other services, particularly planned care, for a period, but they're not doing that until they absolutely need to. Just while we have you, Dr Bloomfield, there's a lot of people in the community that have COVID symptoms, but they are testing negative on rat tests. Why do you think this is? And are you concerned about the accuracy of these daily case numbers? So, uh, what we're seeing is uh, the limitations of rat tests and uh, rapid antigen tests, and we've known this from the start. So, even using them at the point in time now, where there is what we might what we call a, a quite high pretest probability, people are symptomatic. We know there's a lot of COVID out there. We're seeing people, and even if they're in households with other cases, they can be returning um, not just one, but sometimes several negative tests and then a positive test, or some of them symptomatic and never return a positive test, but probably were COVID cases. All this does is emphasise that rapid antigen tests are one tool, but if people are symptomatic, they should remain home. If they've been exposed, and particularly if they're a household contact and have symptoms, they should assume that they do have COVID. So that's one thing. The second question is actually around what proportion of cases we think we are capturing. Uh, just to emphasise, I've been actually really impressed with and um, pleasantly surprised with the number of people we are seeing who are reporting both positive and negative results. And from tomorrow we're going to be reporting uh, the positivity rates for rapid antigen tests by District Health Board. There is a bit of varia variation and that will again help us just build a picture of what the total community burden might be in different regions around the country. But actually I think we've got quite a good picture of the, uh, of the number of actual cases that are out in the community. Just with genome sequencing, are we still doing genome sequencing now that rapid antigen tests mm. are really you know, the main way to go? Yes, we are. Of course, we can only do genome sequencing on a PCR-based sample, so from a nasopharyngeal swab. But there are still several thousand of these being done each day, uh, usually for people who are hospitalised or for um, uh, where someone's had a rapid antigen test and a, a, pos a PCR might be um, helpful, for example, in terms of determining what treatment uh, they might require. So, yes, we're still doing quite a reasonable sample of whole genome sequencing, but just on our PCR tests. Dr. Yes. Bluford, on the 950,000 eligible people who haven't been boosted yet, do you have a bit of a breakdown of sort of where in New Zealand they are, their age group, ethnicity, um, um, you know, if they do inevitably get COVID, what, what pressure that might put in different regions on our system? I don't have that to hand. Um, however, what I would say is, of course, um, uh, we, we do know what our uh, vaccination rates are by District Health Board oh, and our booster rates and I'm actually very happy to, to provide a follow-up uh, table that shows just what the booster rates are by region. Uh, and by ethnicity, so we can do that. In fact, can, anyone who might want that. Uh, I'll just go over this side. I was just going to ask, uh, just as a follow up to that. So, most of, of what we're finding out in terms of the, the types of, of COVID that we're seeing are from PCR tests being done in hospital. Mm -hmm. Those are now overwhelmingly uh, BA2. Is, is it possible that we're seeing some of the more severe cases uh, there just by virtue of the fact that they're being done in hospital? And should we have more of a PCR surveillance program out in the community? Yes, so just to reiterate, there is still uh, P, uh, PCR testing being done out in the community uh, uh, and also whole genome sequencing, particularly where it's material for uh, determining um, uh, outbreak control and or treatment. So there is a mix of both. Uh, Ian may be able to comment on this, but from what I've seen, the BA2 subvariant has certainly um, a, a significant transmission advantage but there's no evidence yet around it being more, more or less severe than the earlier BA1 variant. I think what is material here is no Delta um, uh, genome sequences since mid-February, and of course we know Delta produces more serious illness than the Omicron variant, but it's clearly, I think, been... There are still Delta cases out there, but it's been t almost entirely superseded by the Omicron variant, and we've seen that switch here to the BO2 subvariant um, quite quickly here in New Zealand. How many, uh, how many ventilators do we currently have in our hospital system and uh, how many patients 
uh, would COVID-19 or those ventilators be able to take care of? Well, the first thing I would say is uh, at the moment we've got 22 people in intensive uh, care and we have, uh, as of midnight last night, uh, almost exactly 300 intensive care and high dependency unit beds around the country and about 60% of those are occupied. So we have a you know, less than 10% of our total ICU and HDU beds are occupied by COVID uh, positive people at the moment. And I don't know if any of them are ventilated, but we certainly, I think our ventil, uh, I, I can actually uh, look at the exact figure, I'll have it here. Um, but on a daily basis, generally between 10 and 20% of our ventilators are in use. So we have plenty of ventilator capacity around the country. Do you know how many, how many ventilators we currently have in the, in the whole country? Uh, just let me find that for you, because um, I do have the, the, a table of that uh, right here. So yes, the number of well, the number of ventilators that are currently in service, available for use, is 425, and of those, 68 are in use. That's 16%. And, yes. and how does um, Omicron differ from other variants in terms of a requirement for any ventilation? Is there a lower likelihood that someone with Omicron will require a ventilator than someone with Delta or Alpha? Would have done? Yeah. I think that's really clear. You know, we've got 960 people in hospital, just 22 in ICU and high dependency unit. And actually that's a, similar to what um, has been seen. I mentioned Scotland earlier, earlier on. They've got about uh, 1,800 people in hospitals around Scotland at the moment, but just 27 in intensive care. So it's very clear, this emphasises that Omicron tends to be a less severe illness, but I do want to caveat that with the comment by their Chief Medical Officer in Scotland that is almost certainly due to the fact of vaccination and boosters and also treatments. And our hospitals over the last two years have got, uh, have worked very hard on ensuring that they are providing good and timely treatment for people who are hospitalised so that, that it's early and preemptive treatment. Um, we know, I'm sure all of us by now probably know somebody who's um, had Omicron despite having booster shot and some of them anecdotally are reporting still feeling quite ill. Yes. What's your message to people who hear about those cases and then say, well, what's the point of getting boosted if I'm going to get sick anyway? Well, uh, I'd just like to point to the, to the figures I did quote in my opening comments. Just 16% of people admitted to Auckland over hospitals over a two week period, several hundred were fully boosted. That is, it was at least two weeks since their booster. So, it's about risk reduction here, isn't it? And we know that um, just as seat belts greatly reduce the risk that you will get seriously injured or die in a motor vehicle crash, vaccination greatly reduces the risk that you will get seriously unwell or die uh, from being infected with COVID-19. Was it a mistake to refer to, to refer to the third shot as a booster? Did it make it seem unnecessary to the community? I don't think it was a mistake in that actually that's what everyone globally was referring to it as, and uh, including the manufacturer. Uh, but of course, um, the outbreak is unfolding as we go, and some people may have seen Pfizer, just you know, the Pfizer chief executive, I'm sure for good reasons, uh, announcing a, a couple of days ago that their sense is a fourth dose may well be a necessary part of, or at least ongoing um, shots uh, required. Again, we've been talking for several weeks now about shifting the language from uh, that third dose being a booster to actually talking about being up to date with vaccinations. It's very clear three is enough now. It may well be that four is what is required, especially for um, people who are at higher risk. And I've, I've asked uh, Dr. Town, who chairs our uh, COVID vaccination technical advisory group to, to actually look at this issue over the next week to see are there some groups that uh, there is evidence that may warrant uh, a further dose for them to be up to date with their vaccinations. Oh, sorry. So a follow up question. Um, the, um, are you planning to do anything specific to either increase the doses of the general population or do you have um, uh, plans in place to increase for this fourth dose for this special group? Anything specific that you're looking at to increase the number of uptakes of the booster? Well, we continue to really push and make available uh, the boost, that, that third dose for people to ensure people are up to date. Uh, and that includes uh, the, the, the range of initiatives we had in place to get that very high um, rate of, of vaccination with the first and second dose, 97 and 95% respectively. So we're going to keep pushing. We just want to get this as high as possible. It's really clear that there's a big difference between 73% uh, 
people having had three doses and where we want to be, which is uh, again in the mid 90s. Could, because not only does it protect those individuals, but you get that cumulative population um, immunity effect as well once you get up to those high levels. So we're going to continue pushing it, but I'm just again repeating my, my message to people, if you haven't had that third dose to please do go and get it. it. It's never too late. One other comment I would make is, I know there's quite a lot of interest, um, uh, a specific issue that I've been asked about over the last few days is how long should people wait if they have had um, COVID? How long should they wait for that booster shot if they haven't had it? And that advice would be three months, is uh, what we are saying. And also, we have also just recently updated the period where someone is a, doesn't need to isolate if they are a household contact or a contact if they have had COVID is now a three month period. It used to be one month, but we've updated that to three months. So easy to remember, three months after your infection for that booster if you haven't had it, and three months, uh, unless you are symptomatic, of course, three months where you don't, you're not required to isolate as a household contact. Question. Sorry, just, just following up on that, Dr. Bloomfield, what would you sort of describe the, I suppose, um, the, it's a little bit slower with the booster compared to the, the primary sort of rollout. What, yeah, what would you sort of think the differences in that was? Is it a comms issue? Well, uh, actually, if you look at where we're at now, nearly in the mid-70s, and we only started the boosters in early December, it's probably similar to where we saw. So we saw high early uptake, and then it, it takes longer to get through that last um, part of the, uh, of the population. W what I can say is, and one of the things that I think is working very much in our favour, we, our DHBs worked really hard to ensure that everyone in age residential care had their booster before the end of January. Uh, and also a really strong focus on our older people to get them uh, boosted and people with pre-existing conditions. The, the largest group who haven't yet had that third dose, dose uh, is, our, is younger people and again just encouraging them, some of them because it may well be they didn't get the second dose until quite late in the year, just encourage them, never too late, go and get it. Yeah. Just a quick follow-up question just on um, long COVID and children, um, so obviously COVID spreading through kindergartens and um, schools. Are there any sort of specific concerns for long COVID in children? And you know, is it possible that we now have four-year-olds with sort of chronic fatigue symptoms? Definitely one for Dr. Town. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's a really good question, and I think there is some data emerging, but it's very early days. Um, children obviously are tending to have a milder illness. We would hope that that would mean they're less likely. Uh, to develop long COVID and some of the research projects that are underway internationally will help us with that. Obviously we're focusing on creating a safe environment in all of our schools and ECEs for children at the moment in the meantime and of course our 5 to 11 year olds are also eligible for vaccination here in New Zealand which is another protection. Dr. Dr. Town, just on long COVID, you talked about practical ways of mm. treating it and if someone has symptoms of long COVID go to your doctor and on the Ministry of Health website there will be that's some right. information. Yeah. What what are, what is that information? What is that advice? Yeah, well, it's it's, it's similar to what we would do with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's a question of. Um, recognising and accepting that these symptoms are real. So I think there's a conversation with the health professional. There's no suggestion that these are psychological symptoms. These are a very real experience for these individuals. Uh, the key thing is to pace yourself and have a slower recovery, not trying to rush back to work, accepting that you may need more rest, and sometimes limiting physical activity, particularly if you're having a racing pulse or something like that, or if you have muscle aches and pains. So it is more of a rehabilitation framework, and that's why we're really pleased that uh, Martin Chadwick is leading this, who's our Chief Allied Health Professionals uh, Officer, because he is working in a multidisciplinary framework, and that um, advisory group that I mentioned in my remarks will be setting the tone for that and providing a framework for people to, to adopt. Is that not more preventative, like if you do have COVID symptoms, to take it easy? But for people that are already, you know, suffering long COVID, is there no treatment there? There's no specific treatment. So as you're probably aware, similar to chronic fatigue syndrome, this is thought to be part of a post-viral immune response, which goes on triggering the body and generating these symptoms. So it's very much a framework of rehabilitation and pacing yourself and not overdoing it. And as you say, that's exactly the same during the illness itself. We want people to rest and take the time to recover after that acute phase. We don't know what impact that may have on the occurrence of long COVID at this time. 
Do we know yeah. anything about the difference of long COVID in Omicron versus Delta? No, I think I mentioned in my remarks, that's actually something that we may be able to study here in New Zealand in our follow-up study. So that's of great interest because it's a very important question. Have you received any reports, uh, you kind of alluded to that earlier, that this is real. Uh, early in, in the pandemic, there were certainly reports from overseas where doctors thought that this was psychological. Um, have you report, uh, received any reports in New Zealand of, of GPs sort of dismissing these, these symptoms? I'd be very surprised if that was the case because our general practitioners do take a very holistic view of their patients' well-being. Um, there is no suggestion that this is a psychological or malingering event, so we want people to feel confident about talking with their doctor and perhaps an individualised program to return to work and get back to normal activities over weeks and sometimes months. And how do you think about just what supports might be available for people with long COVID in, in New Zealand? Dr. Um, Mona Jeffries responded at this stage very little. Health professionals are woefully uninformed and patients are being left uncared for. That's, that's pretty bad. Um, at what point do you think that will change? Well, the study that Dr. Jeffries is doing herself, I hope, will, is working on the study I mentioned, will help inform that. And of course, the expert advisory group will be developing guidelines which will distribute to all NGOs and primary and secondary care and doctors you, in New Zealand. Do you know when those guidelines will be up? Because obviously the issue here is how disparate all the symptoms are. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. We'll have to talk with Dr. Chadwick and provide an update about that, but I'll be sitting on that group, uh, so we'll try and proceed at pace. Uh, there are also a large number of self-help uh, groups that have been developed, as you know, on social media, providing really practical advice and support. Sometimes it's just a listening ear rather than anything specific. There isn't a, a magic bullet in terms of the recovery. Dr. Chan, can you say, with the numbers that you're describing, say one in 10, there's a huge number of people who are gonna have some form of lingering yeah. COVID. Is there an, an analogy or some way that you can describe compare it to a different type of illness that is normal and endemic in the community now that we can get a sense of what it is that we're potentially talking about? Because that's tens of thousands of people or more. Yes, well, the NHS will probably have early data on this because they, of course, started um, their experience of the COVID pandemic before us. Um, it is potentially a huge burden but the natural history of this is for a slow but steady recovery. And that's exactly what we see with uh, perhaps a slow recovery after a severe influenza episode. Mm. Dr. Bloomfield, a couple of questions about QR codes. <laughs> Uh, QR codes have dropped to their lowest point in mm -hmm. six months. What is the value in still encouraging people to scan in? Uh, well, first of all, uh, there, there are circumstances where we may want to contact trace people and follow them up. And so uh, I, I think there is merit in people still scanning in. The other thing is, as we come down off the other uh, off the peak of the Omicron outbreak, we may find that we are uh, we want to and are able to use our uh, contact tracing system uh, more widely again, and quite clearly QR codes are, um, are helpful in that regard. Uh, and so I think about it as a bit like mask use. Once you're in the habit, just keep doing it. And remembering that it does provide that record for, for back for 14 days, and you never know quite when it is you might need to know. So I would just encourage people, businesses are still um, uh, displaying them, so I just encourage people to, to keep doing it. And that kind of answers my second question. Um, but another one, will scanning become more important again after the Omicron peak is over when contact tracing isn't so overloaded with cases? Uh, it could be. We're still thinking about what the role of contact tra our contact tracing capacity might be as we come down off the peak. And just ref if, we, if we project forward a few weeks, uh, there will be a baseline level of Omicron of COVID cases in the community. If we if we look at say um, uh, uh, states in Australia or the UK and Denmark, it may well be that we're seeing anywhere between three and five thousand cases a day still in New Zealand for some weeks, even into months. And in that context, it may be it may then be worthwhile, particularly in certain settings, for us to be contact tracing. Uh, and so we would want to uh, make sure that we were able to use our QR code system. The other thing here is, um, and again, I, I, I'm quite taken with the Scottish uh, Chief Medical Officer, but some really apposite comments from him yesterday. And I, I should say, I should give you his name. Uh, Professor Sir Gregor Smith, so a very good Scottish name there. The one thing I've learnt about this virus more than anything else is not to become blasé about it. It will continue to evolve. It is still at an unstable stage in its development. 
until we have global stability of this virus, we can't say we will have domestic stability. So again, one of the other reasons we might actually want to really engage our contact tracing system again in the future is if there is another variant where it's very important we, uh, we, we apply quite rigorous public health approaches to getting uh, on top of it quickly. And I just have a couple of small questions for a colleague. Uh, have you read the letter from the five Super Rugby CEOs relating to increasing crowd capacity and will you consider allowing Super Rugby teams to increase their crowd capacity? I don't know if I've seen a, a, a recent letter from the five Super Rugby CEOs. I certainly had one from a range of sporting codes a few weeks ago and responded very quickly to that through Sport NZ. Uh, we've obviously been supporting um, uh, bigger crowds for the, uh, the Women's World Cup, uh, Cricket World Cup on at the moment. And of course, uh, we will be looking really quickly at uh, the opportunities to look at uh, bigger crowds for the Super Rugby and, and other outdoor sporting events. Again, you know, based on that information that we know that outdoor is a much outdoors are much lower risk setting than indoors. So why are the same rules not currently in place for Super Rugby and the Women's Cricket World Cup? Well, we've been specifically asked um, uh, earlier on about uh, cricket, Women's Cricket World Cup matches, particularly uh, the uh, the opportunity to increase the size of the crowd from just being the pods of 100 to 10% of the, the overall capacity of the stadium. And then I, I, I recall for the uh, uh, game at uh, the Basin Reserve on the weekend to 20% of the total crowd capacity. Um, and I just recognise the cricket, the Women's Cricket World Cup as a, as a very significant international sporting event too. But we'll, we'll be looking quickly at um, the, uh, at the uh, letter from the Super Rugby franchises and other, um, obviously there's um, other sporting codes including uh, the, the football as well that we'll be wanting to, I'm sure they're the same. Now we've got just a few more minutes for, for questions, one here and one at the back. Just on the RAT test and I know our analysis last week as well, but um, in the last week experts have been citing studies indicating that people should be swabbing the back of their throats as well as their nose to pick up Omicron better. Do you have any advice on that? Well, uh, there's, there's, there's uh, interest in and speculation on this. Uh, no harm in, in doing your throat, but do the throat first, then the nose. That's, the, that's my, what I understand is the best way to do. The important thing here is uh, when you swab in the nose, it's not up, it's back, and you've got to go in a little way, so it's got, it, it's, it is a bit uncomfortable. If it's uncomfortable, that's not a bad thing, and give it a good twirl around. That certainly helps with the uh, accuracy of, of the result from the test. Thanks, question down. Um, I understand that the Prime Minister is going to make an announcement tomorrow about border reopenings, possibly to bring it forward some of those dates. Just wanting to know what advice you've given the government about whether or not to bring those forward. Well, far be it for me to do anything that might steal the Prime Minister's thunder on that. So I could just wait for tomorrow for the year. Uh, and she, I'm sure, will um, reflect on the advice that, that was received from ourselves as well as uh, other government agencies on that. Could, could I ask whether or not you would advise not to bring forward those dates? You could ask, but I won't have any comment to make on that. Final question. Uh, we have about two million doses of vaccine on hand right now. I mean, obviously the, the program has slowed down considerably. Are, are we looking at at some point in the near future where some of those uh, expiry dates might be coming soon and we might have to get rid of those doses? Not at the moment. So the, the Pfizer vaccine, we've got still got quite a long period uh, before it expires. That includes both our paediatric and our adult doses, so that's not an issue for us at the moment. Just going to say one final question. Sure. All right. uh, a man died in Pekka Pekka up the Kapiti Coast late last week, um, believed to have been connected to the protesters that had come from Parliament. Now, we have strong reason to believe that that person is confirmed to have had COVID-19, but also potentially that that was the cause of their death. Are you able to tell us anything at all about that case? No, I don't have any information on that, but I imagine in that case, because it was an unexpected death, it will be uh, with the coroner to investigate the cause of death. Thanks very much. Uh, really appreciate you coming up again.